Good morning. Welcome to SSUC, Southminster Steinhauer United Church, where we are spiritual seekers united in community. We're so glad that you've joined us as we seek to create spiritual community with one another online this day. Wherever you are right now, in whatever physical space or whatever soul space you find yourself in today, we are here with one another to sing and to pray, to reflect on life within us, around us, seeking to find with one another those things we need to live meaningfully in this very challenging time. In the midst of all that life is right now, we create this space with one another to still our minds, to settle our spirits, to seek peace and wholeness as we share music and meditation, readings, and reflection. Along with my teammate Chris, who's here with me today, we're grateful for the supportive presence of Brett and Dara in the audio and sound booth with us. And you'll also meet um, a number of others in music and movement today. We give our appreciation and thanks to Rochelle, to Deb, Pam, Sherry Ann, and Barbara Sadler Wells for their contributions to this spiritual gathering. We're continuing our series on the wisdom of trees, and today we're exploring what they teach us about being here. There are opportunities to engage with us this week. Each Monday at 3, you're invited to join us on Zoom for a conversation, just a time to check in with one another, to talk about the things that are on our minds, or to reflect on the theme that we've explored with one another today. This week, Tuesday at 7, we also invite you to join us on Zoom for a time of learning and conversation with each other. We're going to watch a short clip from the documentary Call of the Forest, The Forgotten Wisdom of Trees, and we'll have an opportunity to talk with one another about what we see in that film. The links for both of these times of engagement are in the e-messenger you would have received on Friday. And if you didn't receive it or have lost track of it, you can contact Chris or I for a link. Uh, we'll show you how to reach us on a slide that you'll see at the end of the gathering, a chance for you to jot down a way to connect with us if you need that address. As we explore the wisdom of trees, we remind ourselves that the land on which we find ourselves holds us, nurtures us, opens to feed us. It is storied land, land that has witnessed and weathered so much, land that holds our generosity and our greed, our compassion, and our cruelty. I invite you just now to take a moment to think about the place where you are. This land that you call home and to think about those who have called it home for generations long before us. Who've called it home by so many different names. Those who were first to learn the teachings of this land. And in this time, we recommit to living in more reconciling ways, whether we are treaty people as we are here in Edmonton, or whether the land on which you find your life is unceded territory. As Terry Tempest Williams reminds us, if we listen to the land, we will know what to do. as we seek to be present with each other. We seek to let go of the distractions and anxiety that keep us from being in the moment we're in. So along with Chris, we want to sing ourselves into being in this time together, to sing ourselves into being in this moment, in the beauty and pain 
of what is present to us as we are present to the moment that gathers us. Let's make a settled and sacred space in the place where we are. Let's make it sacred by giving it our attention, by taking the candle that you have at hand, and together let's light our candles so that we have the gift of a flame to accompany us in this time we spend together. We light our candles as an act of faithfulness, as faithful as the earth is turning toward and away from its great day star, that which gives us the light we need for each day, that which is truly our daily bread.
The King's Gift, An Ancient Tale There was once a traveler who, in order to remember all the places he visited, found a stone and added it to his pack. Soon he had so many stones that he needed a donkey to carry his heavy bags. One day, at the side of the river, he met a man who'd stopped for a drink. It was the king of the land, though the traveler didn't know it. This king was known to be wise and calm, compassionate and kind. When the king asked if the traveler had been to the river before, he opened his pack and pulled out a stone with writing on it. He recounted the story of sitting by the stream when a deer bounded out of the woods, splashed water all over him and ruined his lunch. I was very angry and wet and hungry. The king was surprised that he recorded all his experiences on stones. What of the happy times you've had? The traveler explained that he recorded those on his stones too. The king looked at him and with kind eyes said, there are so many stones here, it must get to be a heavy load. The king wanted to help the traveler, so he proposed a trade. I will lighten your load, and I promise you a great gift if you meet me here in three months. In the meantime, I offer you this ring in exchange for the donkey and the sacks of stones. Every time you feel the need to carry another stone, look at this ring. As the king took the heavy load away, the traveler felt empty and scared. He had the urge to pick up a stone to carry but he looked at the ring instead. He hadn't noticed the writing. On the ring were the words, this too shall pass. The traveler visited many places for those three months and had many experiences. When he twisted his ankle, he looked at the ring and read, this too shall pass. And he rested and knew his ankle would heal. He sat on a hilltop and watched a glorious sunset and wished it would last forever. But he read the ring and knew he couldn't make it last by wishing. In three months, the king was waiting for him by the river. The traveler returned the ring and said, thank you. I have no desire to take back the stones I gave you. I feel free without the heavy burdens of the past. But I have a question. When I'm in pain, the thought that it will pass made my heart glad. But when I was happy, the thought that this too shall pass made my heart sad. What do I do? 
from swinging from one feeling to the other. The king replied, Ah, you're ready for the gift I promised you. He took a coin from his pouch and handed it to the traveler. It was old and worn smooth from years of rubbing between royal fingers. It also had writing on it. It said, I have only this moment and the choice of how to use it. The traveler heard the happy music of the stream as he bowed and chose to fill the moment with gratitude to the wise king. We take this moment to focus our intention on those things we need, those things we have to give, those things we long for and hope for, those things for which we pray and seek to be in our lives. And so with one another, we strengthen our intentions, offering this as our prayer this day. We open to sacred mystery beyond our capacity, but within our experience to know. We open to the holy oneness to which we belong, to our deep connection with spirit, with each other, with earth and all life. We mourn our disruptions and losses, grieve the isolation that separates us from the presence we long for. And we seek to embrace our discoveries that reorient our values. May we give ourselves to the transformation that is possible in this time. And so may we live that which we pray. Amen. A piece of wisdom by David Wagoner entitled Lost. Stand still. The trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you, call, wherever you are is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen. It answers, I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, here. No true trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. 
you must let it find you. In the writings of this author, may we find wisdom for our living. We like to walk at Waskahegan in the Cooking Lake Blackfoot Recreational Area, which isn't really too far from our home. There are lots of different wooded trails with enchanting names like Spruce Hollow, Lost Lake, Neon Lake, Grouse Way. And you could spend days in Waskahegan, Blackfoot, Islet Lake, and the central staging area, all connected by a system of multi-use trails that weave their way through the bush and the forest and around the lakes. And you'd be in the good company of all kinds of plants and trees, along with creatures like beavers and ducks and geese, 
all kinds of birds, some deer and some moose. And at every intersection on the trail, you'd see a sign like this one. And on these older signs that are still on some sections of the trail, you'd locate where you are on the map by the head of a screw that is turned into the wooden map indicating you are here. And on the older versions of the map, like this one, each section of the trail has a little mileage marker on the map. So you can see how long each section of trail is and you can judge your progress and you can chart your course. But on the newer maps, you just get a dot that tells you you are here. And no mileage indicators on the map. There's nothing to tell you how far you have come or what trail you could take back that would be longer or shorter. So generally when I'm staring at that map and seeing the words, you are here, what I really want to know is how to not be here. How to not be where I am. How to be someplace else. And I want to know how long it's going to take me to get from here to there and what my options for getting there actually are. Because when I'm staring at the words, you are here, I'm not at the destination of choice. I'm just trying to be somewhere else. And the place where I am is called here, and the place where I want to be is called there. And whether I'm standing in front of that sign on a trail or in a mall looking for a store or in an airport looking for a gate or here in the middle of the woods. Here where I am is not the there where I want to be. But the annoying truth is that I have to somehow understand and accept where I am before I can make my way anywhere else. That's the wisdom I'm learning in this densely wooded area we call a pandemic. There are ways in which this time is dominated by the realities of a deadly virus that are disorienting. There's a sense of being lost, like being lost in the woods. There's a sense of having lost some things we value and finding some treasures along the way too. It's like staring at a map looking for a way out of the trees or a way through the trees that's measurable and knowable. And we're faced with signs like those newer ones at Waskahegan that fail to give us any mileage markers, that give us no way to judge how far we've come and how long we have to go. What we know is that we're here. We are where we're standing, in the thicket. Mostly, we just know we're here. And many of us are standing still, just like the poet advises. And if we look around, the trees and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know and be known. And that's the hardest part. Treating here as a powerful stranger. Asking its permission to know and be known. 
In other words, befriending here and coming into a deeper and more peaceful relationship with here, which is not there. Allowing ourselves to be found by the moment we're in, by the breath we're taking, by the peculiar place where we are in the disorientation of this time where we seem to have lost the way in or the way out or the way through. There's a collection of three stories about disorientation, about the particular disorientation of lostness. Three stories about being lost and found that are stitched together in writings in the Jesus tradition. They're only found in one of the four Gospels. In a collection of stories attributed to a first century storyteller we call Luke. Are these three stories, the first of which is a story of a shepherd searching for a lost sheep that somehow got separated from the others. Ninety-nine are safe and found. But one is lost from the rest. That one is isolated and alone. And as the story goes, the shepherd doesn't give up until he finds it and reunites it with the others. And then there's a story about a woman who has lost a coin, and she turns her house upside down to find it. And when she does, <clears throat> she throws a party because it's not enough to celebrate alone. She needs the community to share in her relief and her joy. And then there's a story about a family, a parent with two children, one who stays close to home and one who is a wanderer, one who seems to know who he is and where he belongs and one who is lost to himself and his family who in his restlessness leaves home, <clears throat> seeking the grass that is greener on the other side of the fence, somewhere, anywhere else, searching for distractions that keep him from having to come face to face with his own deep loneliness and the dis-ease of living in his own skin or his fear of life passing him by, or his discomfort with stillness, trying to outrun the things that haunt him or hurt him, whatever it is that keeps him from making peace with here and wanting to be somewhere else, with time and distance. As the story goes, he discovers that he can't outrun himself. None of us can. That geography doesn't change history. That we take ourselves with us wherever we go, whether we're here or there. In the world of the story, a long way from home, the story says he comes to himself and returns home, making peace with the here that he tried to escape returning to that here that has always been home. In this pandemic time, like the shepherd who lost a sheep, like the woman who lost a coin, we've lost many things. We've lost our illusions of security and we've found a new vulnerability. We've lost our familiar routines and we've found some treasures in solitude and in connections. We've lost the realization that we are not all in the same boat as the meme goes. We're in the same storm. But the craft we're riding it out in is far from the same in terms of comfort or safety. Some are cruising 
in relative comfort. Some are rowing for their lives. Some are plugging leaky rafts. And some are treading water. We've lost some pleasures that come from the freedom of mobility and the freedom to gather, and we've found some treasures buried in ordinary moments that have become extraordinary. We've lost the privileged naivete that a virus could have such a disrupting and disorienting capacity in our lives. And we're not out of the woods, but we're in the woods. Surrounded by trees that are not lost, and in a forest that knows where we are. Unlike the map in the mall or the airport or the one along the trail, unlike the moving dot on the GPS that guides our movement from here to there, the life map only shows us where we are in relation to this moment. The rest of it isn't drawn on any signpost, irrespective of any virus. Life invites a profound relationship with where we are, with right here, right now, making peace with the past of then and there, and letting go of any claim on a future and a grateful acceptance of the gift of being here. Life is surrender, not acquiescence, but acceptance. Like that character in the ancient story, life is surrender to transformation, to discovery that in the here, we have everything we need. We have the self that we are. And in the words of Barbara Brown Taylor, the treasure we seek requires no lengthy expedition, no expensive equipment, no superior aptitude or special company. All we lack is the willingness to imagine that we have everything we need. The only thing missing is our consent to be where we are. This is our time to consider what it would mean to give our consent to be where we are, to change our relationship with the present tense, to change our relationship with where we are, and were we to do so, the trees might be our guide, teaching us a spirituality of acceptance, of grateful presence, of being here and being okay with being here. And were we to do so, we'd be freed from the two most useless words in the English language, if only. And we'd be open to give ourselves to the grace of, and now. This is a time to let our hearts be moved by what is lost and to be joined with one another in that reorientation that begins within and moves out to work together, reconstituting the world.
living in the present, in the now. That is what we wish for us in this day, in this week, and in this time we share with one another. Whether we need to look on our ring, look upon look upon our ring, look upon our uh, coin in our pocket, look upon the candle that we now extinguish. It is a reminder that the present is a gift to us and how we choose to let it inform our tomorrow is ours. May we go from this time and this now into the next moment. May we go together. May we go encouraged. And may we go with support and strength that we give to each other, that we find within ourselves, and that we find in the moment wherever we are. Be well, and see you soon.